Hello, welcome everyone back to episode 125. We have Tom Ruger with us. Oh, Tom, how are you? Hey, hi. Hi, Nidge. Hey, Richard. How's, go how's it going? It's going good. good. So happy to have you here. Such an honor. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, I'm always happy to talk about uh, the shows that I've worked on. Yes. Uh, well, for some, for some of the audience, like, because obviously generation they're uh they're not going to be familiar but uh what shows did you work on uh to get you uh the cre the fame and credibility that you have now people just like oh my god that's tom ruger oh well yeah <laughs> that and uh three bucks will get you a coffee at uh you know starbucks but uh <laughs> i started uh working on uh, shows at hanna-barbera uh I didn't do the original Yogi Bear, but I did subsequent Yogi Bears. I did a lot of Scooby. Uh, I did a pup named Scooby Doo, which was uh, mm -hmm. well, it was liked by fans, and it had sort of Tex Avery sort of wild takes. So it had a little bit of that Warner Brothers sensibility, and that's what actually got me the job at Warner Brothers to work with Mr. Spielberg and Gene McCurdy and everybody. To uh, they hired me to make and come up with uh, what became Tiny Toons. And from Tiny Toons, when, once that was a success, uh, Spielberg and uh, Gene came to me and said, so oh, what do you want to do next? And that was the, the big opportunity because there was a great freedom in creating a new show that wasn't tied to Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck, but uh, you know, original characters. So that was Animaniacs and subsequently Pinky and the Brain and Freakazoid, and so these are the shows I created and, and made it happen. I worked on, uh, I was the executive producer and writer on Batman the Animated Series. Uh, I, did, I created something called Road Rovers and Hysteria, and uh, more recently at Disney, uh, the 7D. And so those are the shows uh, that I've spent my uh, career working on. Oh my God! So you you were pretty much you know you were just popping in the ninety in the eighties yeah. the nineties like you, uh, you you also had a credit for being on Batman Phantasm the theatrical film if I'm correct. I'm I'm the executive producer of that movie, which uh, yeah. in that in that case is I, I'm the guy that's uh, hanging out. <laughs> yeah, you're just hanging out watching this this series. About I watched it. I watched it. I said that's really good. And uh, and they said, "Oh, you're the executive producer, then." Oh, really? <laughs> Just like that? Just like, oh, I like this. No. This is great. Well, I was the executive producer with Gene McCurdy on the series. So when yeah. when they said, "Let's make the animated feature," I you know I was involved in all that. But Alan Burnett really uh, wrote virtually all of that thing, and uh, you know. It wasn't the best animated episode of Batman the Animated Series, but it was the longest, and uh, and. You know, to have a theatrical run with it, uh, it started. It opened on Christmas Day, and I, yes, I, I brought my Day, I brought my kids. To, brought my kids, and the the theater was filled with people from my kids' school. Uh, mm -hmm. The fathers and sons that my kids play with, they for some reason on Christmas Day, right in the afternoon, I guess the mother said, "Go to that movie, get out of here," and uh, so it was filled. <laughs> Filled with friends and uh, and people. Hey, 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 executive producer. Yeah. So it was it was a lot of fun. Oh my goodness, that's great. Well, I mean, I, I I didn't plan on talking about this, but so I'm kind of glad that you brought that up. But you know, you you were since you were an executive producer on Batman the Animated Series along with Gene McCartney. Like, how was it to see this show kind of explode into what? 28 years later, if I'm correct, has become a definitive Batman. Like, dude, how crazy is it that you were a part of that, like, it got to witness it uh, kind of blossom? Uh, now. Well, we knew early on, uh, once Bruce and uh, Eric made this little test reel, it's just a couple minutes of uh, very dark, beautiful footage, Batman fighting the heck out of uh, some criminals yeah. on a rooftop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we said, well, it's not it's not Tim Burton's Batman. It's our Batman. It's our sort of uh, Fleischer Superman version of Batman. 
And uh, we got great cast together, and we knew it was going to be just like a little movie every half hour. Uh, we were going very, very serious. We weren't, we weren't cracking wise. We weren't going to do a lot of humor. It was very sort of dark and straight. And uh, initially, Fox, uh, the network, they were terrified. They thought, oh, we're going to get, we have parents groups coming after us for this. And they, they wanted to like soften it and, and pull it back from its darkness. And uh, they had BS&P complaining about every action made. Oh and, yeah. And so we, we, uh, we basically had to fight. We had to tooth and nail. And they wanted to replace uh, the producers with, you know, uh, people with whom they've worked before. And we said, no, these are the guys. These are, I mean, we're either going to fall, fall on our sword with these guys or not make it. And uh, so I think Gene McCurdy was really instrumental in making sure Fox backed off. And, uh, and then, you know, we make an episode like On Leather Wings, which is just like yes. mind-blowingly beautiful and, and yes. dramatic. And you're seeing things literally, you know, on TV, animated series. You've never seen this before. No. Uh, the, the quality and the performances. We had great actors everywhere. Uh, the music, incredible. So we knew we were making a great show. Uh, that it that it's become sort of this legendary Batman show. You know, you can't, you can never anticipate or guess that that's going to happen. But considering some of the sort of not so great Batman movies that have existed in the past thirty <laughs> years, uh, it's it's good to know that there's this solid uh, animated series that captures the best of the comic books and. Uh, doesn't compromise and, and does its thing beautifully. And, you know, there are a lot of different little Batman animated cartoon series since, but still I think uh, Batman the Animated Series is the, is the grand uh, yeah. model to aspire to. It's yeah, still, it's it steals the cake by like a mile. <laughs> yeah, like it's essentially the it's the foundation that every new Batman series will have to look to. And it's also kind of the foundation the vo voice acting talent because you guys you guys got Mark Hamill at, uh, who was kind of under the radar for a while and then he got to play the Joker so now his performance has become so iconic that I've seen the under actors who have tried to kind of capture that spirit but at the same time they want to be respectful and do their own version, so I can understand how just stepping into those shoes of voice acting wise, it's it's overwhelming because you know this this series created those voices that we now hear in our heads when we're reading the comic books. Yeah, I contend uh, Mark Hamill's the best Joker ever. I, he really is just fantastic. Um, uh, back then, um, I'm from Met Metuchen, New Jersey, a little town, and uh, so. Mark was on uh, the Howard Stern show, and he was talking about doing voices on Batman, and, and he mentioned my name, right? And, you know, Tom yeah. Rivers, uh, a producer on it, and you know, he's done a lot of different things. So uh, suddenly, my town, people in my town, my brother called me up and said, you were mentioned on Howard Stern, oh my God. <laughs> so uh, different culture, you're gonna see, and LA, Howard's not as big. Uh, but yeah. back then, Howard was huge, and Mark on ha Howard mentioning me, oh, it was, I was a, the biggest celebrity in town for a while. Oh, my goodness. That must have felt great just to, you know, not only get a shout out from Mark, who, you know, to, to you, I imagine, was great. He's, he's a great friend, and he's just an awesome person, but to also kind of be like, you know, hey, you know, my, I, I, can, I can go outside and get a cup of coffee, and then people are like, oh, hi, Tom, you know, like, congratulations on getting a shout out from Howard <laughs> Stern. Well, uh, and Mark is, what a mensch, what a man, I mean... Uh, Kelly Ward and I uh, approached him to do this uh, Will You Wear a Mask, I asked, book. Uh, it's like a Dr. Seuss book, but yeah, Mark doing yeah, all yeah. the voices. And, uh, you know, initially Mark said, well, you better talk to my agents. And, 
And then he read it and he said, oh, no, no, we're going to do this. Come on over. <laughs> we're going to record this thing. <laughs> oh, Mark, that... Mark Kondracki brought his equipment to Mark's house. This was during the pandemic and people weren't really yeah. going out. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I think they put the microphone through the window <laughs> and Kondracki was out in his car monitoring it. Uh, yeah, it was wild. And we were, and Kelly and I were at remote locations, you know, on Zoom. So, uh, but he did a beautiful job. He's, oh, that that's wonderful. Do you, do you guys still maintain that friendship? And like, does he does he ask? Oh, hey, Tom, how you doing today? You know, like, <laughs> how's your family? Or is he kind of just? Well, he's got this uh, Mary Lou. He's got this this great family. His wife is just awesome. And and I think uh, if you get Mary Lou on your side. I think that's key <laughs> because, yeah, yeah. Uh, because, you know, Mark, Mark is a character. I mean, he's yes. busy recording stuff and doing things. And, and Oh yeah. And so uh, if, if Mary Lou can get him in front of the microphone for you, that's really uh, crucial. But anyway, uh, Mark is, uh, has been just a mensch. So that's very wonderful. Lucky. I'm, I'm glad. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess we can talk about what everybody's really wanting to know. It's like, so, okay, after Tiny Toons, like, this, this big thing, you know, it blew up, it was very original, it kind of revived Toons back in the day, because I do remember hearing that the show was kind of going off, and it was kind of somewhat falling into obscurity, aside from reruns, uh, and you and your team, you essentially created... Uh, a new foundation of cartoons with Steven Spielberg. And, you know, I, I can imagine how challenging that must have been. But what I really want to know is how did you, like, what inspired Animaniacs? Like, how did that come after Tiny Toons? Well, like I said, uh, after Tiny Toons succeeded, and there was a question, Steven had a real question whether it was going to succeed. Uh, I felt confident about it because, in my opinion, with Tiny Toons, we were just making the cartoons that we wanted to see. Uh, yes. Inspired by the cartoons we loved. Uh, initially, Warner Brothers was saying, oh, make half hours. They're easier to produce. And we said, no, but we're, we're tr trying to emulate the classic cartoon shorts yeah. that we love. And so, you know, we fought them on that. And, uh, you know, we said we wanted the full music orchestra. Warner Brothers was was like, let's just use library music and no. Uh, so uh, midway through uh, Tiny Tunes production, and we're not on the air yet, uh, we got back some footage from Cuckoo's Nest that had uh, like really thick lines. I'm trying to find a, well, imagine the lines were like Sharpie lines. They were just big, fat lines. Mm -hmm. And Stephen wanted the quality of the line to be like, uh, you know, Fievel, uh, you know, the the mouse cartoons that he was making for features, really thin, sort of, you know, yeah, Disney esque uh, Xerox brown Xerox. So he wanted that, and we had these big black lines. He freaked. He, uh, I remember, I got this memo. He said, "This is unconscionable," <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I thought, "Oh, well, I'm gonna pack up my bags now and get my box and get my plant." <laughs> And I'm going to leave. Uh, so literally the next day I was booked onto a flight to Taipei uh, to talk to Cuckoo's Nest and uh, Wang uh, and say, OK, the line quality, let's talk. And uh, so we redid that episode uh, and uh, things straightened out pretty quickly. We had a, a studio, uh, Glenn Kennedy, a great animator. He was doing uh, some of the tiny tunes, and he had this thing where Buster would do these funny bouncy dances, uh, sort of out of nowhere. Uh, Glenn Kennedy would throw them in, and uh, oh, like right oh, in the yeah, middle. He does that like, yeah. When he stands still. Yeah. yeah, and uh, it's like in the middle of a scene where it really was inappropriate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like a dramatic moment, he'd be like, Whoa. and uh, Stephen would freak out about those two. And then uh, two weeks, this is true. And, uh, you know, people say ah, that you're full of it, but it's true. Two weeks mm -hmm. before the premiere of uh, the, pi the, the, the initial episode, uh, uh, 
a loony beginning was to air on uh, CBS at 8.30 on Friday night, like uh, September something, 10th or something like that, uh, the premiere of uh, Tiny Toons. Two weeks before, we were at, in Sherman Oaks, Rich Aarons and like everybody on a Saturday uh, morning, Saturday afternoon, Sunday morning, Sunday, uh, redrawing and, and uh, putting new layouts and animated sketches and to ship to Taipei to finish that pilot. We, we, uh, the uh, team that had been making the pilot had basically quit. They, they had left and oh. it was suddenly, uh, we had footage for the pilot that was really lousy. And uh, not all of it, but a good chunk of it. So uh, we were in touch with, and everybody at Cuckoo's Nest, like hundreds and hundreds of artists and animators that week did nothing but tiny tunes and they turned around this footage in a week and they you know drew it xeroxed it painted it put it on film put it against the backgrounds and so that episode uh is a is a miracle and uh and probably their work that week uh definitely saved me my job because you know if we hadn't hit uh the opening episode uh on schedule and and uh, it hadn't been very good it would have hurt badly yeah. so uh, i understand yeah I, lo I love tiny tunes i actually have the movie uh how i spent my summer vacation and as a kid i literally watched it at least once or twice a day through the whole summer and even on school days every day i would watch that that tape is probably worn out and like sketchy in some place i honestly spent four hours looking through my mom's like, like the closet you know area like yeah. you know all my like i have some stuff i've packed away and i could not find that movie i was gonna like just whip it out right now and be like surprise but i couldn't find it and i'm so upset because I you know there are a, a lot of people i don't know i'm guessing your age a lot my kids are in their 30s uh a lot of kids <laughs> Uh, really, that 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 show, that episode, made uh, meant a lot to a lot of people. I know that uh, the makers of the show Atlanta, uh, the TV series. Yeah. Uh, uh, Glover, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He based uh, season three, I believe, of Atlanta is structurally based on how I spent my vacation. Nice. Tiny Tunes. My God. That, because that song like episodic. Everyone. Never mind, punch rewind, it's summertime again. We're tiny, we're too, yeah, like, they just said at the end. Yeah, I don't know, but yeah, it was just, but yeah, I, yeah, I totally, uh. My only regret in that whole movie uh, is that the speed of the opening song is too slow. That's my only regret. But, oh, okay. well, I thought yeah. you're only. Da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah, I thought it would be like, cause I, I was, I thought your only regret would be it not seeing a theatrical release because I bet uh, that yeah. fans all I, I would have saw it for sure at the theater. yeah they would have come yeah. to see it because it's, it's a tiny dudes movie you would have it as a memory forever well we we actually the only time I've flown on the Warner Brothers private jet and not privately with a bunch of people yeah. uh, we flew to uh, Illinois uh, I'm trying to remember the town but it was a little dinky town uh, outside of Chicago and uh I'll like come up with around it. Chicago, but yeah, like and so Addison, we, uh, maybe it, Addison. It's, it has Madagascar. a funny name. It has okay. a funny, but anyway, we, uh, we, we did a test screening in, in, uh, in this theater and the theater itself, this might help you, was like, okay. it was big, uh, big, you know, but it was a freaking bowling alley. I mean, it was, it was just really long, really deep. <laughs> and so I swear to you, the movie's taking place on the screen up here and the sound. Yeah. In the back row, it's so deep that the sound is out of sync with the picture because oh. it takes longer to get back there. The sound travel. <laughs> but up front, it's in sync. But back there, it's like a little bit off because uh, it's such a deep theater. So anyway, it was filled with kids and we, are, we tested very well. But it was it, both that movie and the... the the, anime, the Animaniacs movie, A Wacko's Wish, we tested them both. They both, and the pointlessness of it, they both tested through the roof and they still didn't give them theatrical releases. So it was like, what are we wasting our time doing these tests? That sucks. Anyway, no, so uh, uh, 
Yeah. Not Spokane, Washington. Uh, oh, it was a funny name. Anyway, so uh, Tiny Toons uh, was this big success. And Spielberg, Mr. Spielberg uh, and Gene McCurdy came to me and said, OK, what's next? And uh, I said, I want to do something uh, original, something, you know, brand new characters, brand new, you know, irreverent. And Stephen was pushing the idea of, of Plucky having a spinoff. Remember and, that? Yeah, yeah and they, they put a couple of episodes of Plucky, the Plucky Duck Show on the air with like a new main title. You know, I'm, I'm Lucky, I'm Plucky. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, and I, I'm actually glad they did that cause be, because that showed that it was, that was a very limited idea. Uh, so uh, Stephen said, all right, Make, come up with your new concept for a show, but you need to have a, a, a marquee name. Have you heard this? I, don't, I feel like I don't want to tell a story that I've told before. but a marquee, I haven't, no. He said, uh, I need a marquee name on the show. I said, well, you're the marquee name. It says Steven Spielberg presents whatever it is. Uh, there's the marquee name. He said, no, no, no. It, you know, the name has to be a marquee. Uh, so that flummoxed me. So I've been yeah. working on these characters, uh, you know, who ultimately became Yakko, Wacko, and Dot. And so I'm walking across the Warner lot, and I'm looking for, you know, I'm thinking marquee name. And I see the water tower, and I realize that's really a marquee for the studio, the WB emblem on the yeah. water tower. And I said, oh, that's a marquee. And Warner Brothers, that's the marquee name. And so... It was at that moment I had my little cartoon epiphany and I realized, oh, I can name these characters the Warner Brothers. I know I have to have a, a girl too, but I'll figure that out in a minute. And uh, I could have them live. And, and I knew they were nuts and I knew they were like dangerous and zany and needed to be like <laughs> kept away from the public so I could have them locked up in the water tower. So uh, we, we pulled all the drawings together uh, on a Saturday morning. McCurdy and Sherry Stoner, and uh, and I went to Spielberg's house. We had milk and cookies, <laughs> and and we had all the artwork for all these different franchises for the show Animaniacs. And uh, and I pitched the whole concept of you know the marquee name, the Warner Brothers, and uh, and he he loved it. Uh, I I sang the theme to uh, another segment. Which I'll sing to you now. Okay. Uh, this is this is the way I, I wrote this song to this piece of music, which is not the ultimate piece of music that we use. But uh, there are Pinky in the brain, yes, Pinky in the brain. One is a genius, the other's insane. They're laboratory mice. Their genes have been spliced. They're Dinky, they're Pinky in the brain. So, wrote it to Singing in the Rain, and he laughed and said, "Yes, that's perfect." And so. That day, we, we went through all these different franchises, and we came, Stephen said, yes, no, yes, no. And he had rejected Mindy and Buttons. He said, well, we have too many pairs of characters. Oh. And, but then his family uh, came in from an outing, and the littlest toddler of the group went up to Mindy and pointed at Mindy and said, I like her. <laughs> and, and so <laughs> Mindy and Buttons were back in. <laughs> it's amazing how family has that power, Peter. That's hmm. wonderful. Yeah, that's, yeah uh, that's how that happened. That should be called the moment Steven Spielberg got owned by a, ch <laughs> by a <laughs> child. That's a, it's cool. That was nice. That's that's hey, the little kid and, came uh, with the clutch. <laughs> and I've I've read that story a couple places, and they always have the wrong kid named. But anyway, uh, Oops. so uh, we started working on uh, uh, Animaniacs. Uh, Slappy, of course, uh, Sherry Stoner had a, a tremendous amount to do with making Slappy so successful. Uh, Deanna Oliver was very much behind uh, the, the good feathers. Um, and also, uh, the whole thing with Mindy, you know, hello, lady, hi, you know, bye, lady, call me mom. That, that was, uh, and that she was bungeed to a tree in her front yard <laughs> was, was all from Deanna, uh, her next door neighbor, a <laughs> kid that was, that was going on next door. Uh, where she lived um you know we had uh i think franchises that really worked and and the beauty of it we had these writers and and directors just brilliant artists 
And the writers like Paul Rugg and Peter Hastings and, and Sherry and Deanna and uh, John McCann and Nick Hollander, yeah. uh, these, all of us were basically, we, we were free to make the cartoons we wanted to make. We didn't really have to get approval from anyone. We didn't have to go through the network. We just said, here's what we're making. Uh, they, there wasn't an approval process. Even uh, Stephen had like a story editor that worked over at Amblin who was supposed to be like kind of taking care of things when Stephen wasn't there. And uh, that story editor sometimes would say, he wasn't a, well, he didn't edit any scripts. He, he just gave his comments and thoughts. And uh, like he'd say, oh, I don't want to do that episode. And we'd say, okay, well, that's, that's we're still doing it, but okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, and we were making shows that uh, made us laugh and with characters that made us laugh. And I, I, I can't speak for all the artists and writers involved, but I, I think it was, for, for me, it was the most uh, creative, uh, free experience in, in my career because we didn't have anyone telling us what to do. Yeah, no, that's even referenced in the song uh, that the sense are just, you know, yeah, they're, they're kicked out, so you're free to do whatever you want. I always agreed that, you know, Animaniacs was. It had no, nobody telling it what to do, coming down, telling you guys, you gotta, you gotta change this, you gotta do that. Like, it could just be free and creative. Yeah. I know we did uh, a screening early on. Uh, we did it at um, Comic-Con. We showed uh, mm -hmm. Hooked on a Ceiling. Oh, yeah. And and full big room and you know and these people were seeing this show with these three characters that they've never seen before <laughs> in their lives and watching this one isolated cartoon and they were roaring with laughter throughout the thing. It's like I mean these were characters they didn't know and they were just completely buying it and by the end of it it was like a, a standing ovation. And uh, Gene McCurdy's uh, husband, uh, Bill Hogan, came to me afterwards and said, you did it. You did something that, and he'd been in children's television forever. Oh, wow. And he said, you, you did it. You did something that everybody I've known that's come in the door and tried to sell shows for the last 30 years, they've all said, oh, it's going to be like an animated Marx Brothers movie. And... And nobody could ever get close to it. No one, and do you want to see the Marx Brothers animated? I don't know. But you did it in a, in a new way that, because they are sort of, uh, they're irreverent and they're wise ass, but they're funny and they're genuine and they have all those sort of Marx Brothers elements and yet they're brand new characters. So uh, he said, yeah, we, we did do it. Oh so, my goodness, that's so amazing. The, the, the names Yakko, Wacko, and Dot, who came, did you come up with the names then too? Yeah. Or yeah. a story behind it? or? Uh, well, that's a Marx Brothers thing, you know? Uh, Groucho, Harpo, Chico. So, <laughs> so we knew that uh, our lead guy uh, was going to be our Groucho, our chatty guy. He's going to be the one, the verbal guy. So Yakko made sense. Yak, 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 yak. Okay, I get it. The yeah. pun's in there, and wacko's wacky. He's a little wackier, and of course, uh, <laughs> it wasn't Dot originally. It was like another boy name, I think, like Smacko or, you know, not Cracko, but... Uh, uh, and uh, so Dot uh, just was the incredibly cute one that uh, really, I think, rounded it out. Without her, I don't, think, I don't think it would work. I think those three together work beautifully. I don't, I don't think they're solo acts, though. Yeah, yeah they're, 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 they're a family of siblings, and they have their own unique dynamic that you can't separate them into their own individual things. They have to be together. Well, well my, my, minus the songs they did. Like, well, Wacko, minus Wacko can do the burp songs on stage. Yeah. As, as, yes. And, and Yakko can, uh, he can sing uh, the, you know, the Nations of the World. Yep. Wacko did yeah. the States. He did the States, too, though. That Wack, Wacko did the States. 
Yeah, Wacko did. United States, Canada. Oh, no, yeah, Wacko did uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Indianapolis, yeah, Indiana, Indiana, and Columbus, Columbus is, the is the capital of Ohio. That has helped me many times. I mean, if I were needed to be quizzed, I'd... I, I would lose on Jeopardy because they'd ask the, and I'd have to go through the whole song and I wouldn't do it in time. But. That, that was the well, ending. That was the yeah. ending. He ended up getting yeah. the question wrong, I think, because he didn't form a phrase of a question or something. Yeah. Yes. He's just sad. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, <laughs> well, 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 speaking of songs, because I've always wanted to ask Rob Paulson this, uh, but since you're here and you were kind of involved, how many kind takes of, did it kind yeah, of. Uh, do, do you know how many takes it took for Rob to get the. Um, to get his most iconic, famous song, uh, Yakko sings the nations of the world. Like, did he? There's a rumor. There's a rumor that it, there was one take. And Are you serious? There's, uh, that's a rumor, and that's uh, unfortunately un, uh, incorrect. Uh, okay. He he came in. He uh, he clearly had prepared. In other words, he was not. He hadn't spent. Uh, you know, he wasn't coming in saying, "Oh, now what is this? Oh no, I haven't seen this." He had uh, spent the weekend and maybe the week uh, because he knew this was a, a great piece of material. Um, and his inflections you know, from one bit, one set of nations to the next, I mean, he really had it down. He didn't have it memorized, but he knew what he wanted to do with it. And of course, we had also given him uh, a guide track, which was what we were driving at. Um, so uh, we did three complete takes that day and we even went in and picked up uh, a few little sections that we felt you know got a little bit slurred uh, so it, it, it took probably three complete takes that we could then you know put pieces together and we picked up a few extra little pieces yeah there is the pauses in between in like the United States Canada maybe Jamaica Peru yeah. Romania, Cuba, Romania, and there's some of them. I can't remember it all, but I actually have the CD of that too. It's, I think it was, what was it called? Yakko's Wish or World? Or, Yakko's World, yep. I actually uh, have that CD too as well, and I couldn't find that either. I, I, I can go show that to you. I have that over there. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Hang on. Yeah, absolutely. I hope you guys are definitely enjoying this. Like I said, please follow him on Twitter as well to give him some support here. I'll go ahead and uh, put that Twitter down again for y'all. And yes. the Yakko's, uh, the monkey song is a bop. And that's what he's saying, water, and that, whoops. He's got them all. That is so cool. Yeah, of course. I, 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 I know what? I, I don't know. Maybe I actually have it in my CD stash. Cause I, you know, because we don't listen to CDs anymore. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's okay. Oh, here he comes. Oh, he got it. He got all the goodies. There's the oh, my God. Yep. This. Yep. Oh, oh, my God. I need I, to get it. I think, I think this, was, this was the first one, I believe. And then, yeah, uh, I had that. I think Yakko's face is on the CD, isn't it? Like a big head, just his head or something? This is Yakko's world. Okay. Uh, can, can and that's the... That's the, the disc looks like? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. I want to see if, I'm, if I remember correctly. All right, this is... Uh, I'll, no, I'll share the disc. Yeah, that, yeah, that's what it looked like. That's right, the blue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what it looks like. All right, uh, let's see. I think I have a couple others here. Well, there's this. Yakko's Wish. Oh, there you go. Uh, this is the variety pack. I, oh, my, did I show you that? Yeah, no, that's not. And uh, yeah, that's that's what I have right there. Oh, uh, I got all, all this that's crazy cool. stuff. That's <laughs> wonderful. Well, yeah, I, oh man, that that is so great. <laughs> um, and and I actually witnessed Rob sing the song live uh, here in San Antonio once, and. Yes. It was amazing how well, even years later, he can still do it like that. Like, and legend, legend says say, says he still practices the song to this day. <laughs> <laughs> that was yes. like a little joke in the Animaniacs community that I remember. So. Yeah, he he's uh, I, I Earl Cress, one of the great writers of our show. Mm -hmm. uh, Earl Cress was. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one of the great writers of our show. Uh, he he uh, passed away uh, way too early, and yes. uh, I'm I'm at his uh, funeral, and uh, because Rob likes this thing that song, so I'm sitting next to Sherry Stoner at the funeral, and and by the way, Paul Rugg and Sherry Stoner, uh, 
Phil Hendry, George Atkins. Those are like, in my estimation, the four funniest people I've ever like yes. hung out with. So Absolutely. I'm at, we're at Earl's funeral and Sherry Stoner leans over to me and she says, and now Rob Paulson will sing all the cemeteries of the world. No, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I just, I, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm at a funeral and I and I uh, am losing it. <laughs> it's just like, it's like you, you don't know whether the, like is this now the time. Yeah, but it's like it would. Sherry y'all Stoner. Would, y'all wouldn't be animaniacs if you wouldn't do that thing, you know. Well, I, I mean, that she would even think that at that moment. I mean, Rob Paulson wasn't there singing, but uh, now Rob Paulson will sing all the cemeteries of the world for no apparent reason. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, I, heard, uh, I heard the rumor of that song. It was created by the Sun. That was in college or something like that, and started. Singing, Which song? Like, uh, the world one with all the oh. countries. Nas- Nas- I'm sorry. Well, I, I, I uh, Randy Rogel uh, wrote that song, and uh, yeah, his son apparently was in college and came up with the idea, and they like, started naming, or he said something to his to Randy, and then Randy ended up singing it slowly and be like, "Oh my God, we could do this," or something like. And it, it, it's I haven't heard that. Okay. But that's very possible. I, I think Randy has subsequently. Uh, that that sounds that sounds about right. That I, sounds good. I don't want yeah. to spread misinformation. No, just, I I, I don't yeah, know. I, I heard that it was his son kind of inspired the idea because his son was attending college and doing like I guess the whole countries and stuff, and he was saying something, and then Randy realized like, hey, this kind of rhymes, and he he kept challenging himself to like come up with like the, the whole piece. You well, wrote he, the you wrote the intro. I know from my understanding it was you that made the intro. Um right? or, let's see we're talking about a, that's a different song. Uh, uh, the, the the um the the capitals I wrote the intro, you know. The whole yeah. Miss Miss Flum Miss Flamille and the teacher with Yak with Wacko and the Jeopardy bit. Yes. That's for the uh the the capital, the US capitals. I wrote all that intro stuff. Um, oh, okay. Randy uh, was working on Batman, and he came up to my office. And I said, "Hi, I'm Randy. I'm working on Batman." And I said, "You know, I'm like, yes, yes." And he said, "I, I wrote this song. Uh, can I play it for you?" And we found a piano, and he played it. And, and he's very charming, and he's really good at it. And <laughs> I said, "Oh yeah, we're, we want to make that. Let's. We're going to make that cartoon." So you can start working for us. Yeah, that's wonderful. That is so wonderful. He he, he uh, grew up in San Diego. Randy did. He was a uh, from like age four a song and dance man. Uh, Kelly Ward, who was in Greece and is, who has been a fabulous uh, uh, voice director, uh, grew up alongside uh, Randy. They were both in a lot of shows down there. Then Randy went to West Point and joined the military and. Uh, he was in Italy, and he saw a poster of the Big Red One, and he saw Kelly Ward's face and name on the poster. He said, wait, I, I grew up with him. I work with him. <laughs> what, what am I doing out here <laughs> in Italy in fatigues? And I think that inspired him to get back to L.A. and try this. Oh, my goodness. That's wonderful. Nice. Um, well, that leads uh, uh, to your next show, which was the third uh, in the Spielberg animated uh, universe. And uh, naturally, I think the most standout characters of Animaniacs were Pinky and the Brain. So, they were and, big. Yes, they were. And they got their own show. And I, ju- I just, like, just, just wanting to know, it's like, so going from from Animaniacs to Pinky and the Brain, was there any standout, uh, any standout episodes that, that you have with that and just transitioning over to, okay, now we're going to focus on Pinky and uh, here's how that's going to go. Right. I, I just have one quick question. Uh, who, who was your favorite Animaniacs character? Oh. I, I just want to know his, you know. Yeah. Mine's I, Yakko, but that's... Yeah, <laughs> I mean... It's hard. I think Yakko is a great choice. Um, uh, I really look at the franchises, quite honestly. Um, I, I had a list. I should some, maybe some other time. I have a list of my favorite animated sure. cartoons. Um, Absolutely. Oh, you actually I don't can have... make that as a video. There's like a tier list. 
uh, program. I forgot what it's called, but people are using it lately where you can do like S rank, A, B, C, like your favorite characters. And you can take the images and slide them on a little graph. So, ah, well, I'm just telling you guys, I've got this list. We could go yeah. over it sometime. Uh, Absolutely, yes. Um, so, uh, you know, I like Pinking the Brain a lot. And, you know, I, and in creating them, they seem like a natural. I mean, they're based on the personalities of a, a couple people at the studio. Uh, Tom Minton, uh, who would, he would talk like this very close and he would, very funny guy. He could say really funny things. <laughs> but it, it would be at a low level. And his, one of his buddies and one of my buddies, uh, Eddie Fitzgerald, would hang out with him. They'd be working on stories and Eddie would like be listening to Tom's stories. And oh, that is fantastic, nerd Tom, that's great. <laughs> uh, so I heard them hanging out uh, in the next office, literally the, the next office, and they were... And I was like, what in God's name are they doing in there? They're supposed to be writing it. And they're, it's like they're taking over the world or something weird like that. So that's where, so, and Bruce Tim had done caricatures of every member of the staff. So I took the caricature of uh, Tom Minton and uh, Eddie Fitzgerald and I put big, <laughs> big mouse ears on them. And uh, that's kind of where Pinky and the Brain came from. Uh, nice. Um, I still and say NARF to this day. <laughs> yeah, NARF, Zort, Poit. Um, so I'd say for favorite characters, I mean, I love the, the, the Slappy Skippy franchise. I love the Wacko Yakko Dot franchise. I love the Pinky the Brain franchise. Uh, I think people ask, have asked me, you know, well, wh where'd you come up with... Uh, Brain wanted to take over the world, and I, I, on, I, at that point, honestly, I said, "Well, don't, don't you want to take over the world?" Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the world would be better if I was taking over it. Quite honestly. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah. So uh, the brain, I think, makes a lot of sense to me. Now, some people think he's megalomaniacal and and weird. I mean, I, I, I see him as lovable in his own sort of flawed way. Matter of fact, I think that's the key to this show, and I don't think people really think of it this way, but all of us that worked on this show, all the writers, we love these characters. We really did. We loved them to pieces, and yeah. I think that makes a big difference. When you really care about your characters and you're imbuing them with what you feel is the best of you, uh, you know, you're, you're giving Yakko all the funny quick lines that you've ever come up with. You're giving Wacko all the funny gags. You're giving Dot all the cute and adorable and, and but then shifting into viciousness uh, bits that you have. And you're giving Slappy all your, your crusty but benign material. Skippy's getting all your peppy, happy stuff. Uh, the brain, you're giving all your weirdest visions of, of dark power, <laughs> yeah, power yeah. and and uh, you're giving Pinky all your the stupidest things you've ever said uh, and the, all of us were at this point in our lives and in our careers where we felt comfortable like really giving everything to these characters and that's why I think the show is kind of as solid and good and funny and lasting as it is mm -hmm. is because uh, this group that was making it was at its uh, creative peak and really uh, devoted to it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like I kind of my my personal favorite duo are Pinky and the Brain because I love their dynamic. One's a genius, one's not a genius, but they're they're kind of they have a kinship because um, the one wants to take over the world, while the other one just supports whatever the other wants to do. So it's kind of like couple relationship where it's like i want to do this and then it's like oh well i'll support you all the way uh and there's a little bit of humor in there too so that they they yeah. really they that's why they they grew on me more than uh than the the warners because i do have a brother do have a sister we we do have our own personalities but i've been with my girlfriend for six years and i kind of consider her my brain 
and me her <laughs> pinky <laughs> because she has all of these ambitions and everything and she does kind of talk low like like this she talks like this and because she's shy and everything and then i'm kind of like the goofball and i'm like oh i'll support you on perfect. the way uh, yeah perfect yeah, you're made for each other. That's great. Yeah, yes, exactly. And she and she loves Pinky in the Brain too. So I'm like, oh my god. Uh, <laughs> but that that is that is so great that those characters got to have their well, show. Yeah, just, I, I think there are great episodes in there. Uh, and I, uh, Peter, uh, who story edited uh, the first large batch of the Pinky the Brain series. I mean, we started with using material from Animaniacs and shifting it over. We, we took elements and shorts and, and uh, used them for the first few weeks of the Pinky the Brain show because we didn't have the, the half hour footage back. Um, but uh, I think uh, we had issues again the, with Pinky and the Brain, since it was specifically for prime time, uh, uh, Jamie Kellner and the WB Network uh, got their mitts on it, and they made a lot of uh, requests. And right. I think if Peter, if Peter had been left to his own design, and uh, you know, and wrote, and with the writing team written the show that we had created, uh, I think we would have had uh, a big success. Unfortunately, uh, the network insisted that it, it be a literally a sitcom with like the wacky neighbor coming by. Uh, Dick Clark played the wacky neighbor, and uh, they really wanted it to be like uh, I don't know, like any sort of WB sitcom, which is just a bizarre request of Pinky and the Brain because it really does not lend itself to no. that yeah. format. Yeah. No, and there, you know. There are there are formats, there are cop procedurals, there are sitcoms, but this Freaking the Brain is a weekly adventure into absurd plans. And uh, it should have just been allowed to be that way. So yeah. when Peter wrapped up his part of it, I think uh, Charlie Howe and Gordon Bresek and Earl Kress and, and a bunch of different uh, creative uh, writers uh, then did a whole new batch, which I, th I think those were more down the lines of uh, the pinky and the brains that we had made for Animaniacs. And I think, in my opinion, the very best of the whole 65 is uh, Star Warners. Yes. Because it, has, because it has everybody in it. And it's really, while it's the final episode of uh, pinky and the brain, it really is a kind of a wrap-up episode for uh, Animaniacs as well. Yeah. With the, then later on, I, I don't know if you did know, Animaniacs would actually get a straight to VHS movie that would sort of wrap it up as well. So was that like, Oh yeah. Well, you mean this? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Of course. It's like, so did, did you guys like, did, did you guys like, I don't know, jump the gun and everything? Oh, like, it was like, Oh, we're going to, we're going to wrap it up with star Warner. And then you're like, Oh, oh no, we had already been making this. Oh really? I, I had already been writing and, and, uh, producing and directing this. And it was all, it was concurrent, yes. Wow, yeah. that's awesome. Well, yeah, this, this thing was finished about a year before they put it out. Oh my God, that's, yeah. that's wonderful. Well, well if I, I wanted, I would love to know, like, just, just how, how did it feel to say, to, to just move into uh, an hour length and kind of just, have all these characters come back for the final time and kind of wrap up their own arcs that they're going through. Like how, how was well, it? I didn't, I didn't look at it as uh, wrapping it up. I thought it was uh, the next step. And I, I was hoping it would turn into a series of these. We had a, a batch of uh, feature length ideas for them that uh, if you go to my uh, blog, I have posters from that uh, cartoonatics, wow. cartoonatics blog. And uh, so we had plans for more Animaniacs. I mean, we didn't necessarily know we were ending at 99 uh, half hours. Uh, but that happened because uh, the WB and Jamie Kellner were getting uh, free access to the Pokemon, sh Pokemon show. Yes. And they were getting them literally for free. 
and they could just run them and they were getting good ratings with those while buying and paying for more Animaniacs was, you know, a lot pricier than free. That's that's understandable, yeah, but that's that's still terrible because I always kind of look at Wacko's Wish as kind of a conclusion to Animaniacs and Pinky and the Brain and just seeing all these characters uh, go on their own adventure, what they want to wish for upon a star. Yeah, I think it works. I, I, I like it. It probably has a two, one or two too many songs, but... Uh, yeah. I really think it's uh, it, it's it's actually uh, it's got some humor. Uh, I think it's got plenty of humor, uh, but it has heart. Uh, maybe more heart than most people would expect. But I also think the whole gag of I love the I don't know why because I'm sick, but I love oh, the whole no. idea. I love the idea that Dot is basically dying throughout the whole episode. Yeah, yes, the whole yes. movie, and then you think she's dying, and she's uh, <clears throat> I'm getting sick. And then she sort of dies at the end, yes. and uh, and but then she wakes up because of the wish, and we're you know uh, she's just really kidding. And she also the op the the operation that she needs that they've been talking about the whole time is just that she's going to have a, a beauty mold placed on her. On her yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is yeah. what a what a what a dramatic actress she is yes yes exactly convincing me that she was really dying and that she had an operation that could save her life and it inspires wacko to go on this journey to get a wish for that and then just turns out oh no she's not dying she just you know she just needs beauty mole the <laughs> and other, she's just the, being traumatic the other moment i think uh which is uh except for maybe a couple slappy squirrel cartoons and maybe a, a gift of gold I think maybe the sweetest moment in the entire Animaniac series is the little story that Yakko tells Dot uh, in town. Uh, you know, when tell tell me the story, and it's the story of yes. when when Dot was born, and the parents said, you know, uh, they were happy, and and uh, it's the whole thing about you know, call me Dotty and you die. Yes, very sweet, and. Uh, um, you know, there weren't that many of those moments. I have people who come up to me and say, oh, that was the nicest moment. You know. Yeah, that's, 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 nice that's wonderful. That's sometimes do that. Because you, you obviously roped in your audience with what Animaniacs is to the point where people are, are actually invested in the character. Yes. And then, and then you throw them that, and people are like, like they're, then they are, they're, they're into it. Because like we got into the characters as kids, right? Like that's what, and then to see that happen, it was like, I think my eyes were sweating on that episode. <laughs> like, it's been a while. I haven't, and like I said, I'm no, not I, 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 haven't, I, I haven't I watched it in a while, and uh, uh, I'm probably going to sit down and re binge watch the whole series again. Now, uh, how my adult mind kind of perceives it. Uh, and also, in the 90s, and you guys were you guys were pretty clever. That I did see like one skit recently. Like I, I remember it as a kid too, but it was Big Butt, like Tiny Toons. <laughs> that was a Big Butt. The, uh, that was uh, Paul Dini wrote that. Yeah. Great writer. Great yeah, writer. Like, but there, even there was the one episode that I almost think now they're trying to like cancel it. Is like when uh, Buster and all the boys they started drinking beer. Yeah, that <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. That, like, that that was censored. That was that was the episode was called Elephant Tissues, but uh, that particular cartoon uh, I think it ran on Fox and then they stopped running it because they yeah, were you concerned. Catch it again. But so it was you didn't one catch can it of time. beer. One can of beer that shared by three characters, and they got so drunk that they drove off a cliff and went to hell or heaven or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. they didn't go to college. They became basically like homeless or something. Like, it was like, yeah, it was but they just, drove. Yeah. They drove up a mountain and and, and yeah and died. <laughs> yeah, yeah, horrible. and 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 then it's kind of revealed. Oh, this was all just you know that this was just another day of uh, getting promotional uh, PSAs out for kids and teaching yeah. them. It pulls so, away, they pull away the clouds and the angels and, and it's back, uh, the set. It's the back of yes. the set, yeah. Uh, I, I love that twist. Oh, um, love yep. Uh, so, let's see. I don't know. Anything else we should discuss today? Oh, yes. Uh, I've been waiting for this. I really oh, have been waiting God. for this. Um, I really want to talk about, in my personal opinion, my favorite cartoon of yours. Uh, it helped me a lot when I was a kid. Freakazoid. Ah, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, okay, so I do know the story. 
of how Freakazoid was created. Originally, Steven wanted to do a superhero show, and Bruce Tim came up with some designs, and his vision of it, that he wanted it to be a kind of dark comedy kind of thing, kind of like The Mask, and was all like, I don't know. I don't know if I like that. And he wanted co- and he wanted to know, if, why don't we just add some comedy in there? And Bruce and him just they, they had two different visions on what Freakazoid was. So ultimately, Freakazoid would be a superhero comedy. And what I really like to know, I think everybody would like to know, is like how different was this experience for you and your team uh, to produce a superhero comedy that is very different from its predecessors, like Pinky and the Brain, Animaniacs, and Tiny Toons, like... Was that a bit of a challenge, or did you guys just be like, let's just do the same thing, but with superhero? Well, you know, we we were on a roll, you know. Uh, Tiny Toons, Adam and X, Pinky and the Brain, they were all successful, which I guess, uh, I guess that might be rare, that, that we're, uh, we're doing several shows at the same time that are really working. But, so... Uh, Paul Dini and Bruce Tim were working on uh, Freakazoid, and uh, and that was fine with all of us because we were really busy with other things. Um, McCurdy, Gene McCurdy, came to me and said, "Well, uh, Tom, Bruce doesn't want to do it now because Stephen wants it to be a comedy, and Bruce wants it to be basically a, a drama with with an mm-hmm. intense character." Uh, so Stephen wants you to make Freakazoid too, <laughs> and and we were pretty busy. So uh, and this was January, this was in January, yeah. prior, prior to the September when it's going to air. Yes. So so uh, so I had the drawings of Freakazoid, mm-hmm. and I knew that he was zany. That's that's what I knew he was, and. Uh, we didn't even have a, a meeting with Stephen. We didn't. We, oh, wow. Uh, we, uh, I talked to him on the phone. I said, so you want me to work on this Freakazoid thing? See, yeah, just make it really funny. I mean, uh, you know, superhero, a funny superhero. That's what we need. And uh, so I remember going home on a Friday and coming back on a, a Monday. And, uh, and it rained. It was weird for LA, but January, it rained like downpour, like flooding from uh, Friday to Monday. And I, I sat in my home and literally, uh, and one of the rare times where I, I, I didn't really think that hard. I just like, I knew I had to generate material. And I, and I, wrote, <laughs> I wrote 90 pages of stuff. But, it, but don't, don't think that's good because it was stuff. It wasn't really like, you know, mm-hmm. uh, crafted art. But basically, I wrote any idea I had that involved a superhero that I thought would be funny. And, and in, in script form, little, little scripts. And, uh, you know, they would be a page long or two pages or a half page. And... Uh, What's weird is almost everything from the 90 pages is in the in the series. Oh my god. Because we were really uh we had to go. We had to really get going. So it it didn't necessarily explain what the series was, but in that was like the Handman episode and uh, uh the legends who lunch and all these little wraparounds like you know hey watch the lip sync and you know and all the stuff with uh the, the announcer uh you know we interrupt this program to bring you this important message i, I love, love you, you. <laughs> yes <laughs> i mean all that kind of stuff uh the uh the freakazoid you know giving the weather re- or actually he's uh, storms uh, tornadoes the well, sky is falling, ah! and we'll have uh, hazy afternoon sunshine uh, right after this. So it would just be these little bizarre bits with Freakazoid. And, you know, that's where I use the lobe to, uh, you know, the lobes in it, uh, Steph's in it. Um, so anyway, 
I had these 90 pages of stuff. Oh, all the Boron stuff is from there, too. Oh, Moron. yes. Moron, where, you know, he's uh, the stuff yeah. with uh, where, he, you know, he comes down to Washington and. and uh, yeah, I am. Boron, you know, and, and uh, what is your message? Uh, I am Boron. I mean, they, eventually they blow him up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there's also uh, another alien ship that comes down and they want to know what's the name of, uh, I think, Barbie's younger sister. Or something yeah, like yeah, that. yeah, yeah. And or he answers, um, oh my goodness. Uh, uh, uh yeah, Ch Cl Chipper or not Chipper, uh, anyway, uh, it all it, Skipper, that, that's Skipper, it. Skipper, Skipper, and uh, Skipper, and then the alien turns back to the uh, people inside the ship, it's Skipper, and you hear them all, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That originally, I, I, I found the script of that the other day, and, uh, and I remember at the recording session, our original line, it didn't play funny. And I oh. said, so, but we didn't have the line that's there, uh, what's Barbie's? We originally had, what's Kramer's first name? Oh. From Seinfeld, and, and frequently says Cosmo, and it's Cosmo, oh yeah. Uh, but it... It wasn't funny. The skipper uh, uh, Barbie was funnier. So that's good that we switched that. Um, anyway, so then the 90 pages went to Stephen and to McCurdy and to John McCann and Paul Rugg, who uh, I'd asked to come aboard and, and be uh, the story editors on it. And yeah. uh, so they started working on more elaborate episodes like... Uh, you know, Candle Jack. Oh, don't say that. Sorry. Yeah, this. And, uh, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, Dance of Doom. I mean, they started working on actual long episodes. Stephen got all the material, read through it, thought it was very funny, thought it was uh, too scattered. Don't just let it be uh, like we're in a blender. And uh, But by having the bigger episodes, we could put these little pieces in all over. Yeah. So, uh, so the process of that was just in January, and then once we started recording, we had a big issue because we had sent out sides, which are like the audition copy for Freakazoid, and we said he is a zany superhero, and we had copy from Dance of Doom, from a couple other scripts. Yeah. And and, and every audition. Every, I mean, I mean, every audition was, yeah, I'm zany, I'm freaking good, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's like Roger Rabbit. They were kind of really going over the top with it or just kind yeah. of not getting it. They're not reaching down to really connect with it. Yeah, they, yeah, they, they were just lost in, in zany land. Exactly. And uh, but some of the material, you could read it in the script, was sort of like straight, you know. Hey Cosmo, how you you know uh, uh, where he talks to the cop? Wait, yeah, uh, yeah, Co yeah, uh, Ed Asner. Um, so uh, anyway, Freakazoid is not always nuts. He's nuts sometimes, but he's really yes. kind of. Uh, so anyway, Rug was story editing, and we were uh, doing auditions, and and I said. I finally said, Paul, go in there and just read this copy, and I just want to get uh, a feel for this. Maybe we have the wrong copy. And so he went in, and, and he, he did it all kind of, kind of straight. And, uh, and it, felt, it felt good. I mean, he was, it was Paul Rugg, who really wasn't the most uh, uh, advanced voice actor. He is now. Now he's like one of the very best in the business. But he was sort of just getting started in voiceover. And... Uh, and he was putting a lot of himself in it, which was really crucial. And so then, as we're doing that, I said, Paul, why don't you, at this point in this Dance of Doom thing, why don't you just kind of go off? Just start talking about uh, whatever you like. Maybe uh, try to get people to dance with you. So he, he then read the entire script again, but just allowed himself to just veer off when he felt like it. And it was effing hilarious it, it, it was, yeah, it was, it, I, I it was genius it was genius so i took that i, I went to uh, mark keats our editor and we cut it into this beautiful comedy episode and we sent that to steven and he flipped out and said oh my god that's 
this is this is as funny as it gets. So we knew we had we had proof uh, of a uh, concept at that yes. point, and uh, we started animating. Uh, and then the next uh, an episode that I wrote that I, I'm, I've always loved. Uh, next time, phone ahead. And it's yes. Boron has come down. Uh, Moron has returned. He's like ET, and he yes. lives. And he goes to Dexter Douglas's house, who is uh, Freakazoid's uh, alter, alter ego. ego. And uh, we show Boron and and uh, Dexter becoming friends, and and Freakazoid being involved, and and we cut to Steven Spielberg's office. Yes, and he's reading through it. And he said, wait, and, and Boron it. eats Dexter Douglas, fade out the end. What? What are you doing? What, what, what does this mean? And we say to Spielberg, well, uh, yeah, the, the episode ends then, and we're thinking we'd show some Animaniac reruns. And, and then it cuts to Animaniac. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then he goes, no, 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 we got to, we got to, come on, here's what we do. Okay, we fade. And, uh, so we go back into Steven's version of the story and he starts dictating it. We continue. And then by the end of it, uh, we go back to Steven and he says, you know what? We should show Animaniac reruns. And we do. Oh, that's wonderful. That, that is, um, since we've already been going for an hour, unfortunately, I have to don't want to leave Nidge here with you. So I just, uh, if you're okay, we would, uh, we usually do a part two sometimes, right, Nidge, where we invite the guests back and yeah, give us uh, time. maybe, like yeah, maybe so. talk about more stuff, if that's okay with you, if you'd sure. like to come back, if we, if we didn't bore you to death or anything. No, that's <laughs> fine. And uh, give me a little warning and I'll find my list of my favorite episodes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It has been an honor and, you know, thank you for being here with us and uh yeah, no, just unprofessionally right now. Thank you for all of these shows, you know, cuz they did they childhood and they 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 saved me from, you know, being kind of died lonely kid and I was able to express myself because of them. I'm so glad you love them and uh thank you for for watching and no thanks problem. For, thanks for this conversation. It's been great. No problem. Problem. Thank you. All right. We, See you guys uh, next time. See you next time. Oh. Okay. Yeah, right. we'll, wrap, we'll wrap it up then. Sorry, everybody. We we're going to have to cancel the Q&A, and I think we're out of time, unfortunately. Yes. So, yeah. I'm assuming Tom's out of time, too. So uh, thank you all for joining and everything. And once again, please follow him on Twitter. And is there any other place that you are at? Uh, Facebook, uh, my Cartoon. Cartoonitix blog. Uh, yep, Twitter's good. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Right. I'm going to sign out. All right, okay. no problem. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Nitro.